October 17th, 2019, Afro-Lanican Jurisprudence. This is episode 19. Uh, again, I'm your host, Smitty Bontan, Professor Smith, and we're here to talk about, again, Afro-Lanican Jurisprudence, 5,000 years or 6,000 years of extraordinary African commitment to equal protection of law. And we're doing a particular subset uh, dealing with Herodotus's histories. The, the Greek uh, historian Herodotus wrote a book called The Histories uh, that was written around 600 BC. And we're extracting information from that book uh, to talk about equal protection and how it describes Egypt, and not just Egypt, but Ethiopia, as a place where law and justice were uh, venerated concepts that the, the concept of mod, order, truth, balance, and whatnot uh, permeated that part of the world and whatever they controlled, which was considerable, and then progressed through there through uh, the Bantu migrations towards the rest of Africa. So what we're talking about here is specifically is the end of that Afrocentric empire of Egypt and uh, Nubia or Kem, uh, Kemet and Kush and how they control the Eurasian world, Greece, Phoenicia, uh, 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 um, uh, basically where, what we consider the Middle East, Arabia. Those were all under African control prior to the Christian era. But what happened, right? You'll hear a lot of Afrocentric historians talk about the greatness of Egypt, the greatness of Kush, uh, the greatness of Ethiopia and Axum, and they were fantastic. But here we're talking about how did things change? And they changed in this respect, the, the Egyptian uh, or, or uh, the Afrocentric Eurasian Empire, the one before the Christian era, fell to the Persian Empire, uh, Persia. Again, you know Persia today as Iran. And we know that Iran is in the central, is, is central to uh, uh, talks about the Middle East and, and dominance over that part of the world to this day. Those peoples along the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, Iraq and Iran, have been players on the world stage for thousands of years. They are perhaps they are after their civilizations that came after the African civilizations. They, uh, as a matter of fact, were dark-skinned civilizations prior to this iteration, so the Edomites and, uh, and Elamites um, that were, um, um, that had Kush and African as their ancestors were the early peoples of those areas. But as a northern people, the, the I guess you can call them Caucasians, but again, the, the folks that were in the northern parts of Europe and Asia, as the ice ages receded, as uh, agriculture started growing there and they, they tamed the horse, they migrated further and further and further south. Uh, and one of the places where they mixed again with those African peoples and became so-called Semitic peoples was Syria, Iran, etc. They even looked, and, and interesting thing is, they even looked at the uh, India as the uh, Eastern Ethiopians, right? So this clash of cultures is coming, and we see that finally through the power of, of, of horse horses and cavalry that the Persians are now able to conquer Egypt and on, they're on their way to Greece. So this is all part of the reason why it's in Herodotus's book is because this is part of the story that you're going to hear with respect to the Trojan War, uh, the movie 300, Achilles, right? This is all part of that story. If you, This is what's going on in Africa at the same time Persia and Greece are at war. It's actually beforehand. Persia actually comes after Egypt first. Why? Because Egypt is wealthier, right? And Greece and Persia are actually aligned at this point. That's something they don't really talk about in the movies, that Persia and Greece are aligned to attack Egypt and Africa. And only thereafter does Cambyses and Croatius, the Lydian Greek king, uh, um, separate and then they start to fight with each other. Uh, and you'll note, uh, we talked last episode about the um, um, conflict between the Phoenicians and the Greeks and how uh, they saw themselves at the beginning of seeing themselves as white or European, uh, seeing the uh, Asian races as quote unquote barbarians, right? The, the Persians and what have you. But at the same time, 
Herodotus describes the Ethiopians not only as uh, Egypt's, e the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, the Libyans, the, the uh, uh, Indians. Uh, they even have people that I'm not even quite sure, the Nasimonians, all as black people. And the interesting thing here, this is why I'm so excited about this particular episode, is the wisdom that is ascribed to those people. Again, Europe being new on the scene, not even completely known. Herodotus doesn't even know how far Europe extends, um, how, uh, where, where its boundaries are. But he does know about that about Egypt. And when they discredit his, uh, uh, his Herodotus as a historian, we can point to that, that he was absolutely correct. The, 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 the boundaries of Europe were hard to know at that time, and yet his description of Egypt, or I'm sorry, Africa, at that time, no, the whole was known as Libya, was very accurate to this day. So uh, Herodotus can't be thrown away. He can't be discredited as the father of lies by Strabo and be taken seriously. We know that he does not have the absolute truth, just as no one does. But we know that we can get a lot of valuable information from uh, Herodotus. And so for this episode, what we're going to kind of call or name this is, uh, we're going to name this after Semeticus. Right, Semeticus, the last African pharaoh. Right, so we know that uh, we know that Egyptian history starts prior to Egypt. We know that again, uh, uh, Nubian or Ethiopian history predates Egyptian history. We know that black folks came down the Nile for thousands of years prior to the advent or establishment of Egypt in around three thousand, three to four thousand BC. We know that through Cemetery L in Kustol that has goods from uh, the territory that's going to be known as Egypt, but also what's known is that in that cemetery in Kustol, again, three, four thousand BC, prior to the Egyptian monarchies and pharaohs, are goods all the way that seem to extend all the way out to Persia, right? right. So this ancient world is popping. Right? Just because we don't have all the information, just because we don't see movies about it, doesn't mean that it wasn't very significant intercontinental, not just international, but intercontinental trading networks by sea, by land, right? Um, and so, Kustul, uh, Nubia, uh, Ethiopia predates Egypt, but we know that they come down. Menes, the first pharaoh, uh, unites Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, Lower Egypt being that close to the Mediterranean, that which is close to what we now know as Libya. We go through uh, a, a first golden era where the pyramids are built, right? The pyramids, the Sphinx, and all that are built in the first 1,000 years uh, between 4,000 and 2,000 BC, 2,000 years before the Christian era, which is 2,000 years before now, right? So when we talk about when you when we talk about uh, after the Egyptian or the African Empire falls, and we have the Persians and the Greeks and the Assyrians and the Romans, and you see these white pharaohs that did in fact exist. These this is 2,000 years after the uh, uh, pyramids, uh, the, the Sphinx, and all that were built. Uh, and some even think that the Sphinx and the pyramids are even older than that. But again, we're not talking 20 years, 200 years, uh, 20 dynasties, 2,000 years. Okay, so Semeticus is coming along uh, around 600. Uh, there's that first iteration. There's the first intermediate period. There's the middle dynasty, which somewhat establishes an international Kemet that actually then becomes greater than Kush and kind of dominates Kush as well, or and Moreau, Napata, uh, as their uh, uh, cities of the Nile further south are being are, are known. There's a second intermediate period where Egypt is finally conquered by outsiders, the so-called Hyksos, and they have horse and chariots. So this is what I'm talking about, where this northern people with uh, from from mysterious origins are coming further and further, 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 further south, and they don't have material possessions. What they have is war machines, right? They have horses, uh, they have metallurgies and whatnot that are causing them to conquer and take and rape and rob, but they don't actually establish states themselves, right? 
Okay, well then becomes then comes the new kingdom, the one of the greatest Egyptian uh, uh, eras with the Queen Hatshepsut, uh, Queen Akmos, uh, Nefertari, uh, Tutankhamun, Ramses. Right, this is when the Egyptian era, uh, empire spans all the way south, perhaps even the Kenya, maybe even Uganda. We know that uh, Ethiopia is within its sway. Uh, the statues at Abu Simbel show that. There was basically a vizier of the south who collected taxes and all that from all the provinces and nations that were uh, um, um, established down to the south, Punt and all that. While there was another vizier that handled the north, because at this point the Greeks, the Persian, um, uh, the Assyrians, the Phoenicians are paying taxes to Egypt. That was what the subject of our previous episodes. Again, we don't want to just, uh, uh, it's one thing to just say that Africans ruled everything at that time, but what is the proof? And the proof is taxation, right? The idea that at a certain amount of time, uh, that, that uh, vases, uh, alcohol, cedar, wood, all types of goods were required to be delivered to the Egyptian central government by the pharaoh from these places. Now, if the goods are collected and they're redistributed back out to the provinces. So cedar wood and silver vases from Greece are going to end up in Ethiopia, while uh, ostrich feathers, uh, ivory, uh, um, um, ebony wood, and all that is going to end up in Syria because of this trading system, this uh, gov central government um, creating a trading system through taxation. So the international, the, the ancient world depends on this. And keep that in note, because even when the uh, Iranians or the Persians come to conquer Egypt, they don't, they stay. They don't just conquer, take the wealth and go back home. They stay because there are immense wealth there, right? They are much wealthier than the place that they've come from, and it's much more sophisticated. So can be so you'll note that the Greeks, the Assyrians, the Persians, all of those that came after the Africans as pharaohs adopted uh, the Egyptian governance system. They tried to become pharaohs themselves. So that's why I'm calling Semeticus, who was a Libyan, the last African pharaoh, because after him, there are pharaohs uh, basically that, that Cambyses and all those that don't claim African heritage. They're there to uh, maintain those trading systems, but make sure the wealth is diverted to themselves in Persia. Okay, so first of all, I'm, I'm arguing that uh, Semeticus as a Libyan is an African. That should be simple, but again, um, because of the way we've been conditioned, we see now North Africa and, uh, as light-skinned or Arab or even white, right? We've seen maps that talk about white Africa. And it is true that um, prior to the European conception, conception of whiteness, uh, uh, Arabs and North Africans were considered white to many people in the uh, uh, sub-Saharan part of the continent. Uh, the Fulani in the West uh, believe that their ancestors were white. That doesn't mean European. That means North African or Arabian, right? That those peoples uh, migrated uh, southward. Why? Because of gold and, uh, and other goods and what have you and integrated with those people. They eventually, again, of course, become black because of the uh, people all around them, and they're going to get absorbed in the native population. But they do believe that their ancestors, their original ancestors, were white because they were Arab or North African. But that begs the question, at what point did that switch occur, right? Um, now, it's hard to say because it's always said that uh, uh, Africa extends to the Pyrenees and Europe extends to the Sahara. So again, if you look at Europe right now, there's so many black people in southern Europe, right? That, 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 um, and there's also light-skinned white people in North Africa. So the admixture, um, there's no reason to believe that that hadn't been the case for a long time. But we do know that um, when it comes to Carthage, Right. Let's say the first cities of North Africa, uh, Carthage uh, of, of the fame of Dido and Elissa that that I've heard. Again, they're they're painted as white oftentimes, but it is very clear. And Herodotus makes very clear that Carthage is the 
a, a city established by the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians originate from the Eurythrian Sea, which is the Indian Ocean, Persian Gulf. So these are a dark-skinned people that became maritime people. The Egyptians didn't mess with water. That wasn't their thing. They, there, there are records of them uh, uh, sailing. Uh, they had ships that traveled the Nile, but as far as controlling the Mediterranean, as, as, as far as con uh, controlling the Red Sea, as far as controlling the Atlantic Ocean, that really wasn't their domain. Um, that was the domain of other Africans. And so a people known as the Phoenicians rise up from the Eurythrian Sea from the south uh, and then conquer basically or control the Mediterranean. Now it's, uh, it's unclear again how much land that they control at any one time because it does seem to be uh, that, they, they, um, that their role is kind of as pirates. But they established beachheads and cities along the coastline. And one of their most famous and, and the one that became the most successful is Carthage. Right, you know Carthage from the fame of Hannibal and their wars against uh, uh, Rome. Right, this is all established by the Phoenicians and Libyans at a time when they are uh, uh, dark skin. How do we know they're dark skin? Well, Herodotus again says that their ships, uh, the ships that they traveled in, their gods that they prayed to, the father of their, the one that they considered their father, uh, is named Vulcan. And he is shaped and colored and styled as a pygmy, a short, small African, right? And they had contact with Africans. Let me, let, let's, uh, um, they actually, the Phoenicians actually circumnavigated all of Africa. Right, uh, the, uh, the Egyptians and the Greeks both attest to the fact that the Phoenicians, as sailors, under the command of Egyptians, right? Because again, the, the the relationship between Egyptians and Phoenicians went back and forth. Uh, we know that the Phoenicians at one time carried off the the oracles, right, of Delphi and whatnot to other places because it seemed at one point that they were uh, in control. However. During other times, and it seems most times, Egypt was in control and had command over the Phoenicians, and one and at one point at, uh, commanded them to circumnavigate all of what was called, or what Herodotus called Libya, which we know as Africa, right? Uh, here's a quote. According to the Greeks in general, Libya was so called after a certain Libya, a native woman, and Asia after the wife of Prometheus. As for Libya, we know it to be washed on all sides by the sea except where it is attached to Asia. This discovery was first made by Nikos, the Egyptian king, who on desisting from the canal which he had begun between the Nile and the Arabian Gulf, so again, uh, we distinguish the Arabian Gulf and the Erythrean Sea, that's why the Erythrean Sea is all the way down the Indian Ocean. Uh, sent to see a number of ships manned by the Phoenicians with orders to make for the pillars of Hercules, right? That's Gibraltar, right? The, 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 the rock of Gibraltar uh, between Spain and Morocco. Uh, the Phoenicians took their departure from Egypt by way of the Erythrean Sea, so they don't even go north. They go south, right, through East Africa and Southern Africa and go around the Horn. Uh, with orders to make for the pillars of Hercules and return to Egypt through them and by the Mediterranean. The Phoenicians took their departure from Egypt by way of the Erythrean Sea and so sailed into the Southern Ocean. When autumn came, they went ashore, wherever they might happen to be, and having sown a tract of land with corn, waited until the grain was fit to cut. Right? It's an interesting thing about uh, travel at that time. Right? This is going to take, this is a voyage. This is going to take months, if not years. Having repeat, reaped it, they again set sail, and thus it came to pass that two whole years went by, and it was not till the third year that they doubled the pillars of Hercules and, and made good their voyage home. On the return, they declared, I for my part didn't believe them, but that in sailing around they had the sun upon their right hand. Right. Um, and note that later, the Persians also tried to make a voyage around the whole of Africa. And the interesting thing about their voyage is they don't even make it. So that even shows you this level of sophistication uh, of the Egyptians versus the Phoenicians, right? That the Egyptians had command of the Phoenician army or navy, uh, uh, was able to command that and sail around uh, Africa and be successful at it, whereas 
according to Herodotus, is the Persians were not able to accomplish it. Uh, then, proceeding to the court, he may report that Xerxes, that's a Persian king, that at the farthest point to which he had reached, the coast was occupied by a dwarfish race uh, who wore a dress made from the palm tree. These peoples, whenever he landed, left their towns and fled away to the mountains. His men, however, did them no wrong, only entering into their cities and taking some of their cattle. The reason why he had not sailed quite around Libya, he said, because the ship stopped and would go no further. Xerxes didn't believe him and killed him. But again, a dwarfish race. Again, uh, we know that again the Bantu migration from Egypt and all the, uh, Ethiopia were a taller sort of African. That the rest of the continent we have the the uh, Sao people. Uh, or the Khoi Khoi, those that speak in cliques in Southern Africa. You've seen that in The Gods Must Be Crazy. We also have uh, the, what's the Twa people, right, that's uh, unfortunately called pygmies, right? Uh, and they also populated much of Africa before the Bantu migration absorbed all of those peoples into the Africa that we know of today. So if you if you recall the... the um, conflict between the Tutsi and the Hutu, right? The Tutsis are tall are tall people, where the Hutu are a smaller, shorter people, reflecting that 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 um, combination uh, of different folks that had inhabited Africa for millennia, for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So I, and I want to say, and I want to make a point that this is 2,000 years before the coming of the European, right, to Africa, the Portuguese. So 2,000, at least 2,000, I want to say even three and 4,000 years before the coming of the European in, let's say, 14 and 15 and 1600, Africans have had contact with each other throughout the entire continent. It may have not been as intense. It may not have been all the way towards the interior. But the idea that, that Africans did not have uh, uh, um, a contact with each other, that they were unaware of what were going, what was going on um, internationally and intercontinentally. I think is, uh, I, mm, I think it's too much, right? It does not give credit where that credit is due. I understand why we, even ourselves, perpetrated because we're not taught this. But we'll talk later about the states of Africa in 100 A.D., 800 A.D., 1200 A.D., 1500 A.D. that preceded uh, uh, European states. But I'm just going to, uh, for now, uh, let's just be impressed by the fact that we're, that sail, ships are circumnavigating all of Africa uh, a thousand years before uh, the Christian era begins, before there's even a Rome, before there is a, uh, uh, at the time when Europe is first being established. Okay. Um, there's other tales of contact. The, the uh, Herodotus describes an Ethiopian king that talks about how some of his people uh, went through the interior, through, again, Libya, uh, and met uh, uh, people by another river, which seemed to be the Niger River. Listen to this. They finally entered upon the desert, which they proceeded to cross in a direction from east to west, right, from the Nile to, towards the west. After journeying for many days over a wide extent of sand, right, we're talking Sahara Desert, they came at least to a plain where they observed trees growing. Approaching them and seeing fruit on them, they proceeded to gather. While they were thus engaged, there came again some dwarfish men under the middle height who seized them and carried them off. The Nasimonians could not understand a word of their language, nor had they any acquaintance with the land. Uh, they were led across extensive marshes and finally came to a town where all the men were of the height of their conductors and black complexioned. A great river flowed by the town, running from east to west, and contained crocodiles. So it seems here, again, 2,000 years before there's a por Portuguese incursion in East or West Africa, we have a discussion of a river with crocodiles and short black dudes, right? Sounds like the Niger River to me. Could even be the Congo River. We're not entirely certain because, again, if, you're, if your jump-off point is the Nile, so many thousands of uh, miles long, you could have been going uh, to the south. But it says specifically that they were, were going east to west, and going east to the west from the Niger River will lead, I mean, Nile River will lead you to the Niger River. Um, 
Okay, and, and he makes, and Herodotus makes very clear again that the Libyans he's talking about were black. It is certain that the natives of the country are black with the heat, that the kites and the swallows remain there the whole year, and that the cranes, when they fly from the rigors of a Scythian winter, flock thither to the past the cold season, right? When the, when the swallows come back to Capistrano. You've heard, if you're old as me, you remember that being a tune. But again, this is understanding and Herodotus and Europeans are late to the game. So we know that others, especially Egyptians and Africa, Africans, uh, have this knowledge and more of events, the swallows and, and whatnot, uh, not just internationally, but intercontinentally, going from Scythia, which is north of the Baltic Sea, the North Sea, all the way to Libya on the eastern or the western side of the Nile and the western side of the Mediterranean. Okay, so this is, I just wanted to establish again the the number one the the sophistication of Egypt, uh, its grandeur, its place in that uh, uh, in that ancient world, um, the the acceptance of again this is now the 26th or the 27th dynasty, so we're talking about after the Nubian 25th dynasty has come up from the south and united all of Egypt together with Ethiopia to maintain its its uh, uh, suzerainty over uh, uh, Greece and, 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 and the Hittites and Persia, I mean, and, and Assyria and what have you, but things are starting to crumble. Right, but things are starting to crumble. It's hard to maintain an empire of that size. There's attacks from all sides. And so the Nubians had to retreat all the way back to Napata and Moreau. And meanwhile, as they did this, Lower Egypt or, or the part of Egypt that's closest to the Mediterranean starts to assert itself and become more Mediterranean than it is African. So that's, again, the significance of this Libyan king, Semeticus. Note the name, the name Semeticus, when you compare it to the names that preceded it is very, very different. Um, um, it's almost as if we, if you looked at a, the American presidency and saw all of those presidents and Taylor and, and, and Kennedy and, and, and Taft. And again, there's distinctions. There's distinctions between Europeans, uh, absolutely latent within that, that group of presidents. But you had to go through 40-some of a similar of Taylors and Johnsons and Jacksons. And then here comes Obama. Right, Obama. Very clearly, the country is not in the same place when there's an Obama as president as it was when there was a Jefferson, uh, well, white Jefferson, when it was a Jefferson Taylor, Adams, and whatnot as president. We know something is different, that there are people in the country that have a certain amount of power that they didn't have at that time, or at least recognition, if not power. So we're dealing the same thing here with Semeticus, the Libyan, being a pharaoh of Egypt in control of upper and lower Egypt, but him ruling from the north and Memphis instead of Thebes in the south. Right? So he's the last African king. And, and again, uh, but we're still attributing Libya to Africa, but after his reign, uh, the Persians take over and whatnot. So... And it all starts with Semeticus' father. Semeticus is a Libyan, but his father, Achmos, uh, seems to be, um, for lack of a better word, a Theban or, 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 or more African or from the south, right? That was a big thing as far as pharaohs were concerned, was to be the daughter. A dynasty meant being a, do a child of a queen mother, that queen mother invariably being Nubian or Ethiopian. Right to maintain uh, stability um, um, in several different respects. So uh, when when Semeticus is uh, uh, I'm sorry when Achmos Semeticus' father is reigning, he's asked uh, for his daughter, the Persians King Cambyses, the one that's about to cause all the trouble, the one that um, is known in causing terror in Greece, in Lydia, and all these other places because of the warlike uh, ways of the Persians, asked for a, a uh, Egyptian princess. Now, uh, Semeticus knows the game because Egypt had done this to other people, right? We wanted uh, uh, 
the Pharaoh would marry a princess from all of these other places, a Hittite princess, a Syrian princess, etc. And so the child being half Hittite and half Egyptian would then be placed on the throne of the Hittites, uh, of the uh, uh, um, of the Judeans or what have you. And that way that people would be governed by someone who has an elite that is, is a native to their people, but is also aligned with Egyptian. They were, they were taught, they were brought up, they were educated in Egypt, but they are then installed more or less as kings in their native lands. Now, because Egypt had done this all over the Middle East, they know that that's what the Persians are doing. The Persians want a, an Egyptian princess because they know Egypt is matriarchal. And so uh, this, print, this, this princess uh, would not be treated as a queen as she had been in the thousands of years prior. Now that the Persians are feeling mighty, uh, Cambyses is now collecting princesses from all these other places as concubines, right? And, and again, the child of Cambyses and this princess slash concubine will then be installed as the new pharaoh or the new king of Egypt, but then but really have allegiance and be educated abroad, right? This, this is very political when we're talking about dealings or the, the protection or the control of women at that time because again so a woman's child we know that's her child and it belongs to the nation where the child of a, of a male eh, right that's my dad well we're not sure okay so the persians are on on the hunt they're, they're looking for wives they're looking for 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 for, for a, a bounty they're looking for treasure um and and even the greeks the Greeks are not as wealthy as the Egyptians, but they're, they're, they even say that the, the Persians, this is what they say about them. Um, these are men who feed not on what they like, but on what they can get from a soil that is sterile and unkindly, who do not indulge in wine, but drink water, who possess no figs nor anything else that is good to eat. If they once get a taste of our pleasant things, they will keep such hold of them that we shall never be able to make them loose their grass. Don't let them in, because if you let them in, they ain't going to leave. The Persians possess none of the luxuries or the delights of life. Well, uh, the problem is they had no choice. The Persians, again, threw in, 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 in horses. I want to stress how important of a military advantage it was to have the mastery of horses at that time. Right, and that is uh, again what to me leads to uh, their overwhelming, um, um, their overwhelming Semiticus and the Egypts, particularly of Lower Egypt. So they come across Persia, they come across Arabia, they come across uh, um, um, Judea and Lebanon and whatnot. They meet up uh, basically at the Persian Gulf. I'm sorry, at the at the uh, um, um, uh, uh, at the Egyptian Delta. And uh, by this time, Akmos is dead. Semeticus, his son, has taken the throne. And it's a European uh, um, 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 bum rush, right? The, the Syrian, the Persians are leading it, but their philosophy and their dealings with all their other, these other nations is get down or lay down. You either join our army to conquer Egypt or we're coming after you next. Now, the interesting thing is, of course, they're gangsters. So what happens after they con conquer Egypt? Those are folks are next anyway. So they're only going to uh, live uh, for a second, but they did all join together. It took all of those nations together to jump on Egypt. And again, we have to ask, what was the taxation situation like? What uh, were we? Was the redistribution of goods was it fair? Um, what where did those folks feel oppressed? Was there a reason why they would not uphold the Afrocentric empire in favor of this this Persian conquest? Right um, now they attack Memphis. Uh, Semeticus and the Egyptians are, are walled up in, 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 in a walled town and they're being sieged by the Persians. So, so you've seen movies where the armies surround a castle and they wait them out for months and even sometimes years. Note that, again, it's an interesting thing to think about sieges and castles and cities at that time. Most of the people, again, 
now there, I, I, I emphasize that there's an urban class in Egypt, which is astounding. But understand that that most people lived on farms or herded cattle and whatnot, even much you know much more than they do today. So gathering all things. So what is a castle or a city? A city is really a bank, right? When you have lots of stuff. Right, being able to have this king or or this this uh, um, um, these cities when you hear of a city state and whatnot to be able to keep your wealth along. Now this may be voluntary, may be involuntary, but whoever is ruling this area, keeping all of the wealth and the most important people protected within the walls of the city is, is important. And so when people come to attack, when Persia comes to attack, they're not bringing two million people to come settle the land, right? They're not, they may be raising the, the, the land, they may kill some of the people, but that's to intimidate uh, those in the cities. The attacks on the cities are there to break down the walls, to gain interest and then could collect all that gold and silver and vases and whatnot that are is being held within that city. That's why it's called that it's more or less a bank, a city bank. Ah, right? All right. Just want you to know. So they they crack the walls. They 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 get in there, they kill off the people, or they, they, they murder a lot of the people, and they capture lots of others. And, and Semeticus himself, the pharaoh, is also captured. This is after some uh, days. So here's the story of Semeticus and his defeat. And the interesting thing about the description of his defeat is that Herodotus makes this claim that, uh, again, consistent with the concept of Mott. Herodotus doesn't talk about Mott, so that's why it's fascinating to me that he's telling these stories about Africans and their piety and their wisdom and their, their sacrifice. And it's so easy to draw the analogy in comparison to the concept of Mott. Um, and so here, uh, Semeticus is unmoved by the death and the capture of his own children, his daughters, his sons, and what have you, and the nobles of, of Egypt. And But when he sees a friend of his being executed, he bursts into tears, right? And everybody sees it. And apparently, all, uh, again, that friendship is essential to school, that his, his favor for his countrymen, right, um, was greater than his own personal interest for his children. Again, shows the type of self-abnegation that was expected of an Egyptian pharaoh that was not expected of others. Again, Herodotus talks about other kings in other places, the Scythian kings and whatnot, and them just having control over people absolutely and them killing uh, people along with them. Right, here's the quote. Ten days after the fort had fallen, Cambyses resolved to try the spirit of Semeticus, the Egyptian king whose whole reign had been but six months. He therefore had him sent in one of the suburbs and many other Egyptians with him and therefore subjected him to insult. First of all, he sent his daughter out from the city, clothed in the garb of a slave, with a pitcher to draw water. Many virgins, the daughter of the chief nobles, accompanied her. I want to make this point really quick because I also want to... Um, um, make the point that, again, when we talk about ancient Egypt, we're talking about uh, a farm class, an agricultural class, a cattle class, an urban class, a noble class, a priestly class. So the idea that Africans were just very tribal um, and that everybody just shared everything, the fact that we had a concept of justice in Mott does not equate to this concept of, tri uh, of complete tribalism where everything is shared amongst each other equally. That there were occupations, that there were some types of merit systems. There even in my argument was currency and whatnot, but there was definitely wealth, uh, um, differing levels of wealth. But anyway. Accompanied her wearing the same dress. When the damsels came up opposite the place where their fathers sat, shedding tears and uttering cries of woe, the fathers, all but Semeticus, wept and wailed in return, grieving to see their children in so sad a plight. But he, when he had looked and seen, bent his head towards the ground, and his way passed by the water carriers. Next to them came Semeticus' son, and 2,000 Egyptians of the same age with him. Remember, again, Africans with these age-set classes, right, that folks of the same ages were basically in sort of a fraternal education together. 
all of them having ropes around their necks and bridles in their mouths. And they too passed by on their way to suffer death for the murder of the uh, 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 Persians who were destroyed with their vessel. For so had the royal judge given his sentence. Right? So King Semeticus saw the train pass on, and he knew his son was being led to death. But while the other Egyptians who sat around him wept and were sorely troubled, he showed no further sign than when he saw his daughter also be killed. It chanced that now when they two were gone, it had chanced that one of his former companions, a man advanced in years, who had been stripped of all that he had and was a beggar, came where Semitic, his son of Achmos, and the rest of the Egyptians were, asking arms, asking for, for alms from the soldiers. At this sight, the king burst into tears, and weeping out aloud, called his friend by his name and smote himself on the head. Now there were some, right, all over a poor man begging who used to be large, right? So Semeticus has feelings where he held himself together when his son is killed. He's held himself together when his daughter is killed by foreign uh, mercenaries and soldiers. But when an old friend he sees is reduced to begging, he burst into tears, and that is what takes him under. Okay, uh, uh, at this sight, the king burst into tears and weeping aloud called all his friends. Now there were some who had been set to watch Semeticus and see what he would do as each train went by. So these persons went and told Cambyses of his behavior. Then he, astonished at what was done, sent a messenger to Semeticus and questioned, saying, "Semeticus, thy lord, Cambyses asketh." Thee, why, when thou sawest thy daughter brought to shame, and thy son of his way to death, that, that, that thou didst neither utter cry nor shed tear, while to a beggar who is he hears a stranger to thy race, thou gavest thou those marks of honor. To this question, Semeticus made answer, O son of Cyrus, my own misfortunes were too great for tears, but the woe of my friend deserved them. When a man falls from splendor and plenty into beggary at the threshold of old age, one may well weep for him. When the messenger brought back the answer, Cambyses owned it was just Croatius, the, the Greek dude. Likewise, the Egyptians say, burst into tears, for he too had come into Egypt with Cambyses, and the Persians were, who were present wept. Even Cambyses himself was touched with pity, and he forthwith gave an order that the son of Semeticus should be spared from the number of those appointed to die, and Semeticus himself brought from the suburb into his presence. Yeah, well, too bad, Semeticus, his son, or at least one of his sons, had already been killed. Now there's another son, Anaris, that seems to have survived along with Semeticus. And again, uh, uh, the Herodotus makes it seem that Semeticus is spared because of um, um, pity uh, from um, Cambyses, but I think it's probably more logical that Semeticus is spared because Cambyses has absolutely no expertise or knowledge of how to run a complicated state that is, uh, spans the almost could be the entire Nile River all the way to Greece, from Kenya to the Greek Isles to all the way to Persia. Uh, commanding and controlling uh, the bureaucracy that maintains taxation and military defense over that territory is immense. And so Semeticus is left in charge, it sort of, or at least to, uh, to, to be around, while the, the, the Persians enjoy basically the fruits of their labor. But um, Semeticus doesn't give up. He doesn't just capitulate. He sparks uh, insurrection, and eventually uh, Cambyses is asked to have him killed. Similarly, one of Semeticus' other son, Inaris, who led revolts and actually killed one of the sons or nephews of uh, Cyrus, one of the, the Persian princes. Uh, you would think uh, that would cause another war, but uh, Inaris is actually uh, killed or, or um, I'm sorry, is allowed to govern for a time, but then he is eventually removed. But, but that shows you, number one, that even after the defeat, uh, Egyptians are revolting because, again, we're not talking about a whole population of Persians coming over to Egypt and replacing that population. We're talking about them trying to control it through military power, right, and through a con confederacy, right? But the Persians aren't done, right, militarily. Um, they're, they want to attack now the rest of Africa. They want to bring Greece under their sway. They want to bring Carthage under their sway. 
They want to bring Ethiopia under their sway. They want the entire empire, not just Upper Egypt. I'm sorry, Lower Egypt. Now, they did get all the way down to Thebes and Elephantine, Elephantine and basic control Upper Egypt, and therefore that's how they become pharaohs, right? To become a pharaoh means that you're controlling the upper and uh, uh, lower Egypt. But again, it's, it's called the 26th, the 27th, 28th, and 29th dynasties because each time we have a different queen mother on some other place or whatever, we're, we're, we're talking about a new dynasty, a new set of kings, and this one being a Persian one. But the Persians overextend themselves and they're defeated in Africa. Um, one thing to note about their defeat in Africa that's a very, very interesting is that he splits the Ethiopians into two, right? He, he describes the Ammonians, Ammonians, right? Those that follow Ammon, those that are basically south of Egypt on the Nile River, but then he also describes an Ethiopian people that are off of the Red Sea, that are further east of those, right, and calls them Ethiopians, calls the others Ammonians, they call, and uh, they all are black and seen, so this is where we're always left to wonder how large was Cush, right, how many provinces, how many, how far did it extend, um, we're, we're still not able to decipher a Meroitic uh, script to see what they even said about themselves, but we know that this empire, these that were, were vast, that they had different provinces and nations within it, that the, that the kings of Ethiopia, uh, the kings of Cush were the king of kings, that the queen, the Mani Rainus and all that were not just queens, but they were the queen of queens, right, that there were many nations and, and states, uh, uh, provinces under them that paid them allegiance. Um, so Cambyses took counsel with himself and planned three expeditions. One was against the Carthaginians, another against the Ammonians, and the third against the long-lived Ethiopians who dwelt in that part of Libya which borders upon the southern sea. He judged it best to dispatch his fleet against Carthage. And it's really interesting. Did, did the Phoenicians come from these people? How affiliated were they since they were all from the southern, uh, southern sea? But anyway, uh, he judged it best to dispatch his fleet against Carthage and to send some portion of his land army against the Ammonians while his spies went into Ethiopia and under the pretense of carrying presents to the king, but in reality to take note of all what they saw. Now, we couldn't conquer Car Carthage at all, couldn't even lay a finger on them. The Phoenicians said they would not go, since they were bound to the Carthaginians by solemn oath, and since besides it would be wicked in them to make war on their own children. Right? The Phoenicians see the Carthaginians as distinct people. Again, we're talking about spans of hundreds and th of thousands of years, of hundred years. Uh, the Ethiopian the Egyptian, the Carthaginian, the Libyan, the world, these worlds are thousands of years old already before Europe is even thought of, before the Americas come into the picture. And we have to appreciate that. So the Carthage, so the Phoenicians are not going to attack the Carthage because the Carthaginians are their long distant children. We established that city so many years ago and we have a kinship with them and no, we're not going to we're aligned with them, so we're not attacking them. So that's out. So part Persia is halted there as far as the Mediterranean. They can't go any further west. Um, they couldn't conquer the Indians, right? The Eastern Ethiopians, right? They asked them to change their laws, what it would do to change their laws. And the Eastern Ethiopians are not conquered militarily or by trade and saying they're going to keep the laws as they were. And then here we come with the spies that they send to Nubia. And this is almost the grand finale. We're going to talk a little, we're going to have another episode that talked about um, how hard it was to maintain the, uh, um, the, 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 the um, Egyptian empire uh, and how Africa then devolved from there to what we know it is now. But this is really the coup de grace because again, when we talk about ancient texts that describe Africa as a place of civilization, not just civilization, but civilization of splendor and of justice, right? Civil living plus wealth, all under a conception of justice. You can't get better than what's coming up. So if you stayed around with me, I am so glad because this is going to be, in my view, amazing. As a matter of fact, 
um, let's pause here, right? Let's pause here because I want to give this so much more attention than rushing for the next 10 minutes. And I know some of you are probably tired. So we're going to save this for episode 20. But when we talk get to episode 20 and we're going to talk about the long-lived Ethiopians, we're going to talk about, again, their, 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 the civil living, social justice, legal justice, uh, their wisdom, um, um, the wealth, crystal coffee. I mean, it's it's amazing. So we're going to pause right here. We're going to stop right here. Thank you for joining us for episode 19 of Afro Atlantic and George Prudence and Semeticus, the, la- uh, the story of Semeticus, the last African pharaoh. And we're going to pick this up hopefully tomorrow or the next day, either uh, uh, the next day and give you episode 20 about African resistance to Persian hegemony, right? The uh, the nobility of the Ethiopian Empire at this time in 600 BC and setting up Moreau. So for all those that join Hotep and look forward to joining you very, 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 very soon. Uh, and thank you for joining Afro-Atlantic and Jurisprudence. Talk to you soon.